Hello my dear friends, today I am here with part 3 of Edgar Allan Poe. I had included these writings of Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe and out of these we have completed The Raven, The Tale Tale Heart, The Fall of the House of Usher in uh, one video in part 1 and uh, The Murder in the Rue Morgue, The Black Cat, the mask of the red death in part 2 in video part 2 so today I'm here to complete the last section as well and all these are extremely important topics when we consider Edgar Allan Poe's work okay so let's begin rather let's continue with Annabel Lee then we will move towards the cask of the Amontillado then the pit and the pendulum at last the gold bug Okay, so let's continue with our third part of Edgar Allan Poe's video. So today, the first lesson is Annabelle, okay, Annabelle, which is written by Edgar Allan Poe. Annabelle is the last poem composed by Edgar Allan Poe, one of the foremost figures of American literature. Here, Anna Bailey is last poem okay, of Edgar Allan Poe. So, from here you might get one question. And uh, it is very simple that we know he, he is an American writer. Okay? It was written in 1849 and published not long after the author's death in the same year. It was published in 1849 after the demise of Edgar Allan Poe. It features, sorry, it features a subject that appears frequently in Poe's writing, the death of a young beautiful woman. The poem is narrated by Annabelle's lover who forcefully rails against the people and supernatural beings who tried to get in the way of their love. Ultimately, the speaker claims that he is born with Annabelle was so strong that even after her death, they are still together. So here we find protagonist Annabelle, okay, and uh, her love story. And in between we find supernatural elements as well that we will discuss in the discussion. Okay, let's start. Let's see the theme of the poem. Love is definitely the major theme of Annabelle, even if it is like. Even if it is a little twisted in places, this is a poem about love. At its foundation, it is about a guy who loves a girl and refuses to quit loving her. The cool thing about this theme is that the poem does not stick to the sunny side of love. It digs deep into the dangerous part of these emotions. The, very love, the way love can trap you, torment you and leave you sad and lonely so friends here we find positive and negative aspects of love as the theme of the poetry of course love binds two souls but here after the demise of a person one should be rational and uh, accept the truth but here in the poetry that does not happen here because of the love of annabelle her lover suffers a lot he is trapped in the love Okay, he is tormented because of the love and at last it makes her lover sad and lonely. So, let's move ahead. Love has made this guy who he is but it is also clear that it is it has ruined his life. One day, he is a happy kid with a girlfriend he loves a lot. The next thing we know he is sleeping next to a corpse every night. Here, friends, we find constructive, constructive and destructive parts of love. Okay, here, constructive part is that the guy was made because of the love, because of the love affection of Annabelle. But after her demise, he has ruined his own life in remembrance of her and every night he is sleeping just next to the dead body of his girlfriend 
Let's see what happens the next. The speaker is obsessed with how and why Annabel died. He wants to know who he can blame for it. At the same time, the themes of death and love are tied together. Okay, theme of death and love are tied together. The poem forces us to ask whether death is the end and has the power to kill love or whether, in fact, love can triumph and continue after death. Maybe the speaker takes that idea a little more literally than he should, but that's his business. In a general way, we can all relate to the idea of grief and loss and faith that come up when you talk about death. So if you ask a general normal person, then he might say that after death, one should forget and reconcile, one should forget their beloved one and reconcile with the practical life. But in this case, that does not happen. He is so much possessed by the lover that he wants to know A to Z everything about the death of girlfriend. This isn't a long poem, but Poe manages to weave all kinds of different themes into it. In this case, he gives us just a hint that Annabelle's family does not think much of him and wants to tear the young lovers apart. In a sense, family gives him a way of talking about the pressure of outside society. All the people who can't understand how pure and true his love is. This is definitely an un-against-the-world Romeo and Juliet kind of poem. Not only are the adults in the poem against the young lovers, it turns out that heaven and hell are lining up against them too. Here friends, as it is told in the earlier slide, that it is likely to be compared with Romeo and Juliet of William Shakespeare. There also we find two lovers of different um, families which have enmities, okay, which has enmities since generations. Now, in the story, Romeo and Juliet dies, okay, because of misconception, okay, and uh, miscommunication rather, not misconception, miscommunication. So here, the same thing is being reflected. And here, elders are of course against these two lovers, but at the same time, it seems that even Heaven and hell, okay, natural agencies are also against these two lovers. So what happens? Let's move ahead. At last, that is the speaker's theory. He never quit comes, sorry, he never quite comes out and accuses God of taking away his girlfriend, but that seems like where he is headed. It is not exactly a religious deal. He just seems like a paranoid guy who thinks the whole universe even the part, even the parts he can't see, is ganging up against him. When tragedy strikes, it is not uncommon of people to ask big angry questions about heaven and earth. Friends, just like a normal person, okay, who experiences bad days, obviously question God, heaven, faith, etc. In the same way, the protagonist in this story, the speaker, also asks, Questions, all big questions, uncommon questions. So, whether he gets the answer or not, let's find out. Let's see the characters at first. In the poem, Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe, there are two people that grew up together and fell in love. This poem was so grand that the angels were jealous and came down from heaven and gave Annabelle Lee a chill that killed her. Her family came to get the body and brought it to their land to be buried. So here Annabelle and her lover's story was so famous that even angels in heaven became jealous and because of conspiracy Annabella, sorry, Annabelle died. Her friend, narrator, husband is so distraught over her death that he kind of curses the angels for taking her away from him. The friends were so distraught that he went to her grave and laid beside the corpse. We are to assume that he died right there. 
the poem is just not about the love between two people but it is about the heart break the man felt and obviously died from a broken heart so here friends we find for the lover friend and husband of annabel it was not tolerable therefore he went to the grave of the protagonist that is annabel and he laid down there and died out there because of broken heart and he accuses angels for this here the character is annabel lee and uh, she is very non descriptive we only know that there are two major dis uh, characters the narrator and annabelle edgar allan poe wrote this poem in 1849 it was published after his death okay there is no relationship status given to these characters only that they are in love and that love was so great that angels were jealous enough to kill her after annabelle dies she is taken by high born kinsman to be buried in their land it's safe to say that kinsman didn't like annabelle's love friend smoop further we see the angels were jealous of the relationship between annabelle and the speaker they sent a chilling wind to kill annabelle whose family buried her in a tomb by the sea the speaker claims that the child would love between herself and annabelle himself sorry and annabelle is stronger than the love of those older and wiser and that neither angels nor demons can separate their souls in his grief the speaker reveals that he spends each night la uh, laying beside annabelle in her tomb so this was the reason of the death of annabelle which was sent by angels okay so this is something which has made the narrator extremely distraught sordid and very sad the poem is related by a first person voice who was actively involved in the event which he now recounts akin to a fairy story the narrator transports to transports us to a kingdom by the sea that existed in the remote past when both he and his loved annabelle were just children despite their youth their love for each other was unsurpassed so strong that even angels in heaven coveted it because of their jealousy a cold wind chills annabelle in the third stanza she died she dies and her body is carried away to the grave by high born kinship kinsmen sorry even though they have been separated by death the angels continued to envy the love that remains between the narrator and his child bride indeed as the narrator proclaims in the penul penultimate fifth stanza nothing can ever sever the bonds severe there is a spelling mistake slight please rectify this s e v e r e okay severe the bond severe means to cut okay separate bonds that join them to his love he is always reminded of her beauty by the sight of the moon and the stars dreaming of her every night as she lays in her tomb by the side of the sea so here we find even angels accomplishing their plans they were not satisfied okay they were not happy because the love of the narrator and annabelle remained as it was annabelle was loved by the narrator wholeheartedly even after his even after her death let's talk about literary devices of the story a sonance is the literary device which we find at first a sonance is the repetition of vowel sound in the same line such as the sound of a and i in it was many and many a years ago and this maiden she lived with no other thought then we find imagery imagery is used to make readers perceive things with their five senses poe has used visual imagery to make the readers imagine a cold and desolate place 
where he lives with his beloved in a kingdom by the sea and in her tomb by the sounding sea next to the list is personification personification is to give human characteristics to inanimate objects and here for example the wind came out of the cloud by night chilling and killing my annabelle as if the wind is a human and capable of killing another person so here we find personification alliteration alliteration is the repetition of consonant sounds in the same line such as i sounds in than to love sorry a l sound in than to love and be loved by me and w th that is th sound and l sounds in but we loved with a love that was more than love next it symbolism symbolism is using symbols to signify ideas qualities giving them symbolic meanings that are different from the literal meanings the sea is the symbol of evil and darkness moon and the stars both symbolize the speaker's lover and her stunning beauty next is allusion allusion is an indirect reference to a person place thing idea of a historical cultural political or literary significance po has used allusion in the 10th line seraphs in heaven which alludes to the bible when it degrades the angels to the level of demons so here these are the literary devices that we find by this we have completed the story annabelle sorry the poetry annabelle we will move towards another poetry now now we will do the cask of amontillado let's see the title at first the cask cask means a large barrel okay it means a large barrel where liquid are stored all right cask means a large barrel where liquid is stored okay let's move to another word that is amontillado Amontillado is a pale dry wine from Montilla. Okay, you can say it is a wine from Montilla. Okay, so it means a liquid storage item. Okay, and liquid is wine. So let's see what is there in the story. The cask of Amontillado is an exercise in unreliable narration and ambiguity. Ambiguity means which is not clear. Okay. It is a revenge story in which the wronged party appears much more evil and aggressive than the one who has supposedly done any wrong. The cask of Amontillado is an exercise in unreliable narration and ambiguity. Let's see the publication history. The cask of Amontillado was published in the November eighteen forty six issue of Gaudi's Ladies Book. In this book, it was published, okay, uh, which was at the time the famous popular periodical in America. The story was only published one additional time during Poe's life. Let's see the title about the story. The story is set in an unnamed Italian city at carnival time in an unspecified year and is about a man taking fatal revenge on a friend who he believes has insulted him. Okay, it is about fatal, dangerous, deadly revenge. Like several of Poe's stories and in keeping with the 19th century fascination with the subject the narrative revolves around a person being buried alive in this case by immurement which means to deposit in a tomb alive as in the black cat and the tell tale heart po conveys the story from the murderer's perspective 
we have already done the black cat where the narrator is extremely possessed against this cat's eye okay which is only one okay one eye of the cat is damaged and because of that he kills the cat all right and in tale tale heart there is a man whose eyes he did not like okay so he kills that man he brutally chops his entire body and buries under the room's floor okay but his heart is not able to accept he keeps on hearing sounds around him and finally when police comes and tries to find out what is the uh, wrong thing that is happening here then the narrator himself reveals everything okay because because he could not stand with that guilt anymore so the same kind of thing we find here as well we are able to see this story from murderers murderers perspective so let's see what is the story the story's narrator montresor montresor tells the story of the day that he took his revenge on fortunato you have to keep in mind these characters names okay first one is the narrator that is montresor okay and his friend uh, his friend is fortunato okay italian for fortunate one a fellow nobleman to an unspecified person who knows him very well angry over numerous injuries and some unspecified insult he plots to murder his friend during carnival when the man is drunk dizzy and wearing a jester's motley so here we find the narrator killing his friend when he was not in senses let's see the theme of the story now theme is ambivalence at first we find there are so many things which are not clearly mentioned in the story readers are never told the nature of the thousand injuries of fortunato and montresor himself seems somewhat ambivalent about the revenge he takes on his friend he himself is not clear okay for what particular reason he is taking revenge for what what is that thing which is pinching him from heart against this friend next is self delusion montresor appears to be under the delusion that his murder of fortunato is just or perhaps even that fortunato has wronged him at all while fortunato is under the delusion that montresor means him no harm so here the narrator that is montresor is not able to understand he is in total dilemma uh, he thinks that if his friend has wronged something okay or he is just making speculation okay so he is to be taken revenge on or not so this is the dilemma of the narrator next theme is substance abuse alcohol and drunkenness play central role in the story contributing to fortunato's gullibility and gullibility means which can be deceived okay ultimately demise in montessor's wine cellar so here this is the theme of this story let's move towards the summary of the story poe's short story actually takes place in two time periods the bulk of the events occur on the night of carnival which is a western christian celebration that take place before lent carnival is a celebration of excess of food drink and fun before the restriction of the lenten season sets in before easter
in the United States, the carnival season is better known as Mardi Gras. Please remember this because in one of the questions I have seen this question. Okay, what is carnival season called in United States? You have to write Mardi Gras. But the story is told in rest, retrospect by the narrator Montessor Montresor five years after the event to an unknown listener only refers to as you in the story that means that there are actually two different time frames happening in the cask of amontillado readers learn that montessor montressor is planning to take revenge on his one time friend fortunato Readers never learn exactly what Fortunato has done to Montressor to push him over the edge. Only that Montressor feels he is the victim of a thousand injuries and one unnamed insult he must avenge. So, as I have mentioned in the theme that it is full of ambiguous situations, so here we don't know for what purpose he had taken Fortunato, revenge with Fortunato, okay? And what are his thousand injuries? That is also not clear. And how he has insulted him? That is also not specified in the story. Readers also learn that Montresa has hidden his rage in order to convince Fortunato that they are still friends which is all part of the plan on the right of the sorry on the night of carnival montressor puts his plan into action he knows that fortunato considers himself a wine connoisseur so montressor isn't surprised that fortunato is already drunk when he finds him in the middle of the carnival celebration so fortunato who was drunkard he had lost his physical control and he was totally dependent upon someone else and montressor took the advantage advantage of the situation and he killed fortunato for taking revenge what kind of revenge i told you it is not clear montressor tells him about a pipe or about 150 gallons of Amontillado he bought. Amontillado is a fine sherry wine. But now that he has the wine, Montressor is afraid that he was duped. He tells Fortunato that he was on his way to find Lourdesi, another wine connoisseur, to help him determine the wine's authenticity. So here, somehow he wanted Fortunato, okay, Montressor wanted Fortunato to drink and lose senses so that he can take revenge. Therefore, he provided wine to the fullest. Montressor's ploy works. Montressor knows that Fortunato is full of himself and the idea that someone could judge the Amontillado pricks his ego. As a result, Fortunato insists on checking the Amontillado himself. Montressor half-heartedly tries to dissuade Fortunato, telling him that going into the catacombs or underground vaults where generations of the Montressor family are buried will worsen Fortunato's head cold. Fortunato waves of Mont Montressor's concerns, saying that he shall not die of a cough, and he follows him into the vaults to taste the Amontillado anyway. So here, Fortunato was also a little bit conscious, therefore he questioned to Montressor, but finally fall a prey. As the man ventured further into the dark underground passageways, 
Montresor makes sure that Fortunato keeps drinking. Fortunato asks about the Montresor family's coat of arms and Montresor tells him that their family motto is Nemo me impune, lassicist, or no one attacks me with impunity. Fortunato is so drunk that he misses the warning in Montresor's words and instead asks whether Montresor is a member of the Masons of Fraternity with an elite membership. Montresor says yes and holds up a Mason's trowel, implying that he is a literal Mason instead. Fortunato asks thinks Montesio is joking and by the time they arrive at the niche where Montresio says he is stored he has stored the Montelado, he is too drunk to notice that there is no wine inside. He does not even insist resist as Montresio chains him to the wall. So here friends we find that Fortunato was anyhow to be killed here because of his drinking, excess drinking of alcohol. And uh, this was the planning of Montresor which gets accomplished at last. So I finally he chains him to the wall. Please keep in mind in the examination you might be asked how Fortunato was killed by Montresor. So here you have to write, he chains him up to the wall. Montresor then reveals the bricks and mortar he has stored in the vault and he begins to wall up the opening of the niche with Fortunato chained inside. The process is long one and Montresor describes Fortunato's fearful cries and attempts to pull free from the chains but Montresor is determined and he throws a lit torch into the niche with Fortunato before he finishes walling him in alive here friends we if we go through the torture of Fortunato's Fortunato by Montresor then we understand that it is so inhuman First of all, he made him drink, then he chained him up, and then he lit his body alive. Okay, so this is so inhuman, and why he is doing so, it is not clear at all. What kind of crime he did, okay, which is not clear. By this point, Fortunato is panicked. He is screaming for help, but... The pair are so for underground that there is no one to hear him. He tries to appeal to Montresor's logic saying that he will be missed by Lady Fortunato and the rest. Montresor is unmoved, finishes sealing up the vault and leaves Fortunato there to die. Montresor finishes his story by telling the listener that there, Fortunato's bones remain 50 years later. So here, after many years, he tells the story to the readers that Fortunato's bones are found, the remnants are found there inside the wall still. By this, the story ends and the readers are still unclear about the crime of Fortunato towards Montresor. Therefore, the theme has no clear mention of any crime. Therefore, it is ambiguous. Now we will do The Pit and the Pendulum, which is written by Edgar Allan Poe. Let's see the publication date and details. The Pit and the Pendulum is a horror story written by Edgar Allan Poe and first published in 1842 in the literary annual The Gift, 
a Christmas and New Year's present for 1843. It was edited by Eliza Leslie and published by Carey and Hart. The tale has been adapted to film several times. The work helped secure its author's reputation as a measure of lurid gothic suspense. Here, the story is a horror story, of course, okay, which is written by Edgar Allan Poe. And he is, through this writing, okay, through this story, he is able to prove himself as a gothic writer, horror writer. Okay, so let's see what is there in the story. About the story. The story is about the torments endured by a prisoner of the Spanish Inquisition, though Poe skews historical facts. The narrator of the story describes his experience of being tortured. The story is especially effective at inspiring fear in the reader because of its heavy focus on the senses, such as sound, emphasizing its reality, unlike many of Poe's stories which are aided by the supernatural. The traditional elements established in popular horror tales at the times are followed, but critical reception has been mixed. So here, friends, we find the story of a prisoner okay, of the Spanish Inquisition. And uh, here we find some historical facts as well. And it is the telling of the experience, okay, sharing the experience of being tortured. And here we find supernatural elements, of course, for that only Edgar Allan Poe is very famous. All right, and this particular story establishes him firmly for the same genre. Here, the theme, the first theme is death, okay, and second is religion. Next, we will see in our next slide. Let's discuss death. The pendulum represents an immediate and direct threat to the narrator's life, but even if he narrowly escapes execution, at the end of the story, he will still someday succumb to his inevitable mortality. So death is the one of the themes of the story. And uh, literally, if you take it literally, pendulum is going to kill the narrator. Okay, But later on, we find that even though he escapes the death, he is going to lose his mortality someday because he is human being. Okay, Next is religion. The Spanish... Inquisition, though given the authority to punish heretics for their crimes against the church, has become an overzealous organization that convicts and tortures people oftentimes without evidence. So religion is also included here because of the heretics and crimes against church. Okay, the people who go against church norms Okay, they are tortured and they are regarded as criminals. Next theme is time. Both the narrator and the reader are acutely aware of the passage of time as the pendulum slowly, torturously descends on the narrator. Fear. The narrator is placed in several fearful situations prior to death. Fear is there throughout the story and it is said that death is peaceful but fear of death is so intimidating. This is there in the syllabus of class 12 CBSE as well, Deep Water, where the narrator says that death is peaceful but the thoughts related to death is very painful okay so that is what we get to see out here as well his torture comes from his exposure to fear of dark the unknown rats claustrophobia pain death etc somehow he is able to overcome each of these struggles until in the end i struggled no more but the agony of my soul found vent in one loud long and final scream of despair so here we get to see that even though 
he was able to get over most of his things with which he feared okay with which he was very much fearful but finally he had to face it let's see the characters in the story the very very first character the very first character is the narrator itself no matter how hard he tries to use his mental faculties to assess his situation and avoid his tortures the narrator is out many word by his tor tormentors and reduced to a state of near madness at first terrified of being prematurely buried the narrator is frustrated in this in his attempts to explore his prison his terror increases at the threat of the pit gives way to that of the pendulum to the point that he becomes nearly mentally unhinged he finally manages to affect an escape from the pendulum only to be confronted with another inescapable death so here we find the narrator okay who is who tries to use his all mental abilities but still he is not able to get out of that particular situation mentally he becomes so much tormented that he reaches to madness state then we find narrator is extremely frustrated to explore the prison okay because he finds terror everywhere so finally we find he manages to uh, escape okay from the pendulum but he is near to another terror next is inquisitorial agents inquisitorial means an investigating agents okay there are shadowy figures the narrator does not clearly see but who carry him into his prison give him food and drink and prepare his torture so here there is another character okay which is not physically formed all right physically appeared in the story but there are vague figures shadowy figures and they provide everything that uh, the protagonist requires but at the same time they are preparing for his torture as well next character is judges at the beginning of the story the black robed judges who are officials of the inquisition pronounce the narrator sentence of death so here judges are the one who utters who orders death for the narrator general lasley lasley is the napoleonic general who rushes in to rescue the narrator just as he is about to fall into the pit at the end of the story so here another character is general lasley who say who saves the narrator the unnamed narrator is brought to trial before sinister judges of the spanish inquisition now we are going to read out the summary okay pope provides no explanation let's start with the summary the unnamed narrator is brought to trial before sinister judges of the spanish inquisition who provides no explanation of why he is there or of the charges on which he is being tried before him are seven tall white candles on a table and as they burn down his hopes of survival also diminish he is condemned to death whereupon he faints and later awakens to find himself in a totally dark room so here the main protagonist whose name is not mentioned was being trialed before the judges nobody knows what is his crime okay but he was made a culprit and out there he finds a white candle which was burning so as it was getting decreased his hopes of survival was also getting decreased so here we find comparison of his situation with that of a candle okay so at last what happens he faints because of excessive thinking he faints and then he finds when he awakes he finds himself in a 
himself in a totally dark room. Let's move ahead. At first, the prisoner thinks that he is locked in a tomb, but then he discovers that he is in a cell. He decided he decides to explore the cell by placing a scrap of his robe against the wall so that he can count the paces around the room. But he faints before he can measure the whole perimeter. Then he reawakens to discover food and water nearby. Out here we find the narrator thinks that he was buried alive inside the tomb. But he was wrong. Later on he discovered that he was inside the prison. Okay. So he wanted to check how long, you know, what is the length and breadth of the room. But he faints out there. And when he awakens, then he finds food and water nearby. Somebody had kept these two things for him. Let's move ahead. Here, he tries to measure the cell again and finds that the perimeter measures 100 steps. While crossing the room, he trips on a hem of his rope and falls his chin landing at the edge of a deep pit. He realizes that had he not tripped, he would have fallen into this pit. After losing consciousness again, the narrator discovers that the prison is slightly illuminated and that he is strapped to a wooden frame on his back facing the ceiling. Here, the narrator, he tries to measure the perimeter. Perimeter is all sides of the room. Okay, length and breadth of the room. So, he he calculates and he finds that it is 100 steps. Please keep in mind that it is 100 steps because MCQs will be very difficult okay, for higher examination and they will ask you minutely. So, what he does, he while doing this, okay, while checking the perimeter of the room, he finds that there is a deep pit. Okay, he trips and he finds a deep pit and he realizes that if he would not have done so, then he would have um, got into this pit. So, after that, he loses his consciousness and when he discovers his senses, he finds that the prison is slightly illuminated and that he is strapped to a wooden frame okay and uh, he was facing at the ceiling so this had happened after becoming awake after getting senseless by tripping on his clothes loose clothes and finding the pit above him is a picture of father time with a razor sharp pendulum measuring one foot from horn to horn suspended from it here please keep in mind that how far was this razor sharp pendulum you have to write one foot from horn to horn okay the pendulum is swinging back and forth and slowly descending designed to kill the narrator eventually and here the pendulum which was just above him right it was descending gradually it was coming towards the narrator okay and Obviously it was obviously it was done to kill the narrator finally. However, he is able to attract rats to him by smearing his bonds with the meat left for him to eat. The rats chew through the straps and he slips free just before the pendulum can begin to slice into his chest. Here he applies the meat leftovers so that rats can come and eat the uh, strap. Okay, and uh, finally, he was away from the death. He was out of the danger because he was able to free himself right before the pendulum was about to slice his body. Okay, so the death was over. The pendulum is withdrawn into the ceiling and the walls become red hot and starts to move inward, forcing him slowly towards the center of the room and the pit. 
as he loses his last foothold and begins to topple in he hears a roar of voices and trumpets the walls retract and an arm pulls him to safety the french army has captured the sithand toledo and the inquisition has fallen into its enemy's hand now he was so fortunate that he was saved by that pendulum at first okay but there was another danger and that was the wall had become red hot it was designed in that manner okay and the red hot walls started moving towards the narrator and he it was designed in such a manner that the narrator had to stand finally in the middle of the room where the pit was okay so out there what happens he hears the voices and trumpets okay this was because another troop had captured this province and now this in inquisition okay this investigation center had fallen into enemy's hand therefore all the things were startled everything was stopped because the province had gone to another army that is french army okay french army had captured provinces that is sithand and toledo of spain and thus the narrator was saved so by this we have completed this story the pit and the pendulum the pit it is a sign of danger okay and pendulum as well okay pendulum it stands for literal death and pit as well but the sounds the voices of the trumpet is life saving for the narrator because this shows that somebody was victorious over span uh, spain sorry and french had french army had stopped all the activities of these two areas therefore the narrator was saved so here by this we have completed the story we will move towards another story now let's move ahead let's move towards the gold bug this is another story by edgar allan poe let's find out the publication date and details of the work the gold bug is a mystery story by edgar allan poe it was published in june 21st 1843 in the philadelphia dollar magazine please keep this thing in mind friends and the date of publication as well you might be asked that in which magazine it was published the gold bug was published okay you have to mention that it is philadelphia dollar magazine it was later published in the collection tales his story won the grand prize and was published in three installments beginning in june 1843 the gold bug was an instant success and was the most popular and most widely read if poe's works during his lifetime it also helps popularize cryptograms and secret writing here we find that the work the gold bug received many awards okay and uh, this proved him as a writer and it became very famous throughout his life he wrote other poetries as well but this has become extremely famous for the career of edgar allan poe and it popularizes cryptograms and secret writing okay cryptogram means word puzzle especially in which text encoded by a simple cipher to be decoded you can say a word which will be deciphered which will be comprehended by the person okay word puzzle in simple language and secret writing the gold bug is a mystery story by american writer edgar allan poe the story follows william legrand who was bitten by a gold colored bug his servant jupiter fears that a uh, legrand is going insane therefore he goes to legrand legrand friends 
an unnamed narrator who agrees to visit his old friend. So here, friends, we see. Now we are doing the. Now we are doing about the story. The gold bug is a mystery story by Edgar Allan Poe. That is clear. And here we find William Legland, who was bitten by gold-colored bug, gold-color insect. Okay, and his servant Jupiter. Please keep on putting in mind the characters. William Legrand, Jupiter, its servant. Jupiter thought that because of the bite of the bug, he is going to be insane. Therefore, he goes to Legrand friends, Legrand's friends, and. he asked them to visit the place so one of the friends was ready to visit legrand pulls other two into an adventure after deciphering a secret message that will lead to buried treasure the story set on sullivan's island south carolina is often compared with poe's tale of ratiocination as an early form of detective fiction so here we find legrand who had deciphered a message decipher means to decode okay decode means to understand the secret message all right so he understood the code word in which the message was written and he said that it is going to lead him to buried treasure now we will see the setting of the story it is in island Sullivan is the name of the island okay which is in South Carolina please remember the name of the places which are very crucial and this is compared with another work of Edgar Allan Poe that is tale of ratio ratiocination sorry and it is a detective fiction okay theme of the story now one of the narrative is that one theme of narrative is that any mystery that one human intelligence can construct another human can solve it solve if the person applies his or her intellect properly and persistently now here the theme is that use of intelligence okay implementation of intelligence that a person has now we need to understand about the mystery okay something is mysterious because somebody has made it so okay somebody has um, modified into codes okay which you have to decode in order to get that message okay the message could be related to treasure related to some security etc okay so that particular person has used intelligence in order to make it a puzzle in order to make it a code word code message now another person has to use his intelligence his or her intelligence to decode the same okay so here entire theme of the story is intelligence implementation of intelligence use of intelligence in simple words okay let's see the character details william legrand he is the main protagonist of the story an eccentric scientist william legrand lives on a remote island in south carolina with his servant jupiter a freed slave legrand moved to the island in shame after his family lost their fortune which he is determined to restore now here he is a scientist okay but eccentric he is not a normal person okay there is some weird thoughts which comes in the mind of william okay and he has started living in remote island why is it so it is because he wants to restore the uh, lost fortune of their family and along with him there is another person and he is freed slave okay you must have learned about bonded bonded slavery okay and he was freed from there therefore jupiter was living with william the grand okay he hopes rise when his hopes rise when he spots a beetle that appears to be made of solid gold both jupiter and legrand's friends the unnamed narrator believe a bite from the gold bug has driven legrand insane legrand manipulates their worries tricking them into helping him unearth buried pirate treasure here we understand that the jupiter that is servant and the friends of the scientist legrand scientist friends okay they 
believe that because of the bite of Goldberg, Legrand has gone mad. He has become insane. Okay. Now he wants to get the treasure of the pirates because he thinks that uh, there he has decoded the message and now he is going to get the pirates treasure. For that he took the help of his friends and Jupiter. The unnamed narrator is as much a mystery to the reader as any other element of the story and in some respects perhaps more so. The reader is given no description of the narrator or real insight into the character or character other than he believes Legrand to be insane. So here we find there is no vivid description, physical description of the narrator but still we get more about the uh, scientist through him. The, his primary purpose appears to be appears to be to recount the events of Legrand's discovery of the buried treasure, asking Legrand questions to elicit background information, especially how he solved the cipher and what the coded message means. So here, um, Legrand's discovery, okay, the Legrand's whatever he has discovered, that was related to treasure, he thinks, and he wanted to get the background as well. And for that, he needed people. Next character in the story is Caption Kid. Sorry, it's Captain, okay? It's Captain Kid. William Kid, better known as Captain Kid, is the infamous pirate who buried the treasure Legrand digs up. Infamous means famous for bad things. Keep in mind, it is famous for bad things, alright? So here, Captain Kid was also infamous. He was also famous for bad things, okay? And uh, he was the one to bury the treasure Legrand's digs up. Okay, Captain Kid had buried the treasure and uh, Legrand was the one to dig up the treasure. Another character is Jupiter. Jupiter is a loyal freed slave who decides to travel with his old master, Legrand, to an isolated island to work as his valet and servant. Jupiter's misunderstandings of his master appeared to be comic. Now here, Jupiter was freed by Legrand and therefore he wanted to do anything for Legrand. But it is so comic, it is so funny that randomly he believes Legrand, his master. Further, let's know more about Jupiter, but they point to the broader way in which the information Legrand possesses is misunderstood by all of them when not seen in the proper light. Modern readers are apt to interpret his behavior and dialect in many cases correctly as racist representation. So here we find Jupiter, okay? had a specific character and only modern readers are going to describe him. Otherwise, he was misunderstood by other readers. Then we find Lieutenant G, a fellow scientist on the island. Lieutenant G is equally taken with his gold bug Legrand discovers. So here we find another fellow scientist on the island okay, who was equally in search of gold bug that Legrand had discovered. Let's move towards the summary now. Many years before the story is present, the unnamed narrator of the gold bug made friends with William Legrand. He was a descendant of an old Huguenot family of New Orleans. Now he lives in a hut on Sullivan's Island, nine miles from Charleston, South Carolina. Once wealthy, Legrand lost his fortune and now lives in a lives a simple life with his new found land dog and one servant, an old black man named Jupiter, a former slave. Well educated, misanthropic, subject to mood swings between enthusiasm and melancholy, Legrand spends his time fishing, exploring the island and collecting shells and entomological specimens of which 
he has many which he has many one unusual cold day in october the narrator visits legrand after an absence of several weeks as the narrator wants himself by the fire legrand enthusiastically tells him about a strange bug he has found one of the brilliant gold color with three black spots on and long antenna friends here uh, uh, the man was well educated but he hated mankind okay misanthropist means the one who hates mankind right and this is just opposite of philanthropist okay you must have heard the term philanthropist okay so that scientist was not at all a lover of mankind okay and uh, therefore we find him enthusiastic sometimes okay related to his topic related to his science if something occurs then he becomes so much enthusiastic otherwise he is very sad now not only that legrand uh, spends time out there fishing exploring island and collecting shells and entomological specimens now here entomological specimens means a uh, science study uh, of scientific study of insects okay and uh, you can say uh, anthropods especially okay anthropods means insects all right next we find a specimen i guess a specimen is very easy it is an individual instance that represents a class or is example okay so here we find that particular scientist was also there who was very brilliant okay who was very intelligent as well but the problem was that he was he had mood swinging problem and uh, he used to be excited very quickly and melancholic very quickly as well now here when legrand was there and uh, narrator was warming himself by the fire he says that he found a bug and it was a brilliant gold color with three black spots on long antenna here you have to keep in mind this act that the narrator was doing you might be asked that what was the narrator doing when legrand found the bug you have to say he was warming himself by the fire let's move ahead because he has lent the bug to a soldier from nearby fort moultrie legrand cannot show the insect itself instead he draws a picture of it on a piece of paper he takes from his pocket as the narrator holds the paper the dog jumps on him causing his hand to, hand to move close to the fire now here we find legrand wanted to legrand could not show the insect therefore he made picture of it but because of the dog uh, he it went near to the fire when he looks at the drawing he sees a representation of a skull rather than a bug legrand is visibly upset by his friend's reaction examines the drawing by candle and then locks it in the desk saying nothing more the narrator thinks it prudent not to upset legrand further and takes his leave now here legrand did not want to show the bug in that island therefore he made sketching of the bug insect okay but it came out to be a skull rather than the bug and legrand had become very upset but the narrator did not want to make his friend um, upset therefore he kept that paper okay he locked it and then he says no further discussion over it then he leaves about a month later jupiter delivers a note from legrand to the narrator in charleston begging him to come at once the urgent tone of the note and jupiter's comments that legrand is acting strangely and must be ill alarm the narrator jupiter insists the legrand has been bitten by the gold bug the narrator fears that his friend's mind has become unhinged especially when he sees the spade and scythe that jupiter 
has been told to by. So here narrator had left that place but at the request of Jupiter he comes back because he says that his master that is Legrand has lost his mind. It has become loose. Okay. So here he comes back and then what happens let's find out. On returning to Legrand, the narrator is even more fearful. Legrand says that the bug will make his fortune as though the insect were real gold. He promises that the narrator will understand the excitement if the narrator will accompany him and Jupiter too to the mainland on an old night expedition. The narrator's assistance is needed and he is only person in whom Legrand can confide. Finally, after coming back, the narrator is now convinced that Legrand has lost his mind. He has become mad. Okay. The narrator fears that Legrand has indeed gone mad, but he agrees to Legrand's request. The party is led by Legrand to an area of density, wooded hills and crags. Using the Sayath, Jupiter clears a path as directed to a tall tulip tree. Legrand constructs him to climb, instructs him to climb the tree, taking the gold bug with him. The narrator fears that Legrand has indeed gone mad, but he agrees to Legrand's request. The party is led by Legrand to an area of dense wooded hill and crag. Okay, this we have done. Jupiter, however, follows instructions, climbs out on the seventh limb and there finds a skull. Legrand directs him to drop the bug, which is unusually heavy, though through the left eye socket of the skull. After Legrand makes calculations on the ground, the party begins digging but finds nothing. Remembering Jupiter's confusion, Concerning left and right, Legrand rightly concludes that Jupiter made a mistake. An error, the error is corrected and digging proceeds to another spot. By now, the narrator is beginning to guess that there is, me there is method in Legrand's apparent madness. So whatever was happening and whatever was instructing, whatever, was, whatever Legrand was instructing to his servant, Okay, the narrator found very weird and he thought that he has gone apparently mad. The digging uncovers some human bones and a large chest. Inside is a wealth of gold and jewels. After some difficulty in removing the treasure to Legrand's hut, the men examines their wealth, estimating it to be worth a million and a half dollars. An estimate that the narrator says later proved to be proved to be much too low. Once the men's excitement has subsided, Legrand explains how he was able to solve the riddle that led to finding the treasure. The paper on which Legrand had drawn the bug proved to be parchment and therefore nearly indestructible. It was found half buried near the wreck of a long boat and near the place. So here we have read the story about the gold bug and the gold bug for Legrand was extremely important because he thinks that this is going to give him a treasure that also happened but the amount was very low compared to the present uh, valuation so here Legrand finally understood that it was nearly indestructible so by this the story ends I hope it is clear to you all Friends, by this we have completed all the 10 works of Edgar Allan Poe in three parts. And if you require PDF related to English literature, you will there you will find everything. Just contact.